Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tina Jordan, Director with the ANA Data and Analytics Practice Group. It's a pleasure to have you here this afternoon for our Thursday webinar, Real CDP Talk, What's Next for Marketers Looking to Future Proof Their Digital Strategy? With Projol Banerjee, Founder and CPO of Zeotap, and David Robb, Founder, CDP Institute. It's really a pleasure to have them both here today. Um, and just to give you all a little bit of background, Projal is the founder and chief product officer of the award-winning customer intelligence platform, Zeotap. He shapes the company's strategic vision, forges product strategy and drives execution. Projal is also the co-founder and board director of the Indian femcare company, Nua. His prior roles include Chief Product Officer at Premium, Premium Developer, MobileCo, as well as VP of Marketing and Business Development at Mobile Marketing Platform, Fiber. And many of you know David. He is the founder and CEO of Customer Data Platform Institute, which educates marketers and technologists about customer data management. David was named the customer data platform category winner in 2003. So it's really great and an honor to have you both here today. Before we get started, I do have a couple of housekeeping items to share with um, our attendees. And before I do so, you'll see we have a number of different sessions um, coming up. Um, in the calendar year on behalf of the data and analytics group, and we do hope you'll join us. How we will be running the program will be as follows. We would encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom box where you'll see Q&A at the bottom, or you can submit it via chat for all, whichever you prefer. We'll take the questions at the end of the session, but you're welcome to submit them at any time. A PDF version of the presentation and a recording of the webinar will be available for viewing and posted for ANA members on the ANA website within a few days. And finally, if you have a data inspired campaign that you would like to submit, we encourage you to submit it to our ECHO Awards um, our deadline is December 18th, 2020, right around the corner. So just a reminder about that deadline is near. Welcome again, everyone, and thanks for tuning into our ANA webinar with David Robb and Projal Banerjee. We're going to switch over to the screen now to David. Thank you very much, Tina. And let's see if we can press the buttons in the right order here. Well, not so, not so trivial, you know, for us. Uh, Oldsters, but uh, hopefully you guys are seeing my screen. Somebody say yes. The answer is yes. Yep. Excellent. All right. So we've now proven uh, our technical chops already. Uh, so great. Thanks again for joining. And let me share my video, which is a frightening thought, but what the heck? There we go. Okay. So great. Join uh, again. Thanks everyone for joining. Glad to be here. And my very favorite topic, uh, uh, customer data platform. So we're just going to have a sort of a, a Q and A format today. But before we get into that, we'll do a little more detail about who is the CDP Institute, which uh, I am the founder and CEO. And our mission at the CDP Institute is to provide vendor neutral education for marketers and technologists about customer data management, which often but not necessarily involves CDPs and it's free to anyone who's listening here today. Just go to www.cdpinstitute.org and you'll find a wonderful website with lots of cool things that I will not bother to list here. Um, one of the things that we do at the Institute, which is important, is we try to, to minimize the confusion about what is and isn't a CDP. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so we run something called the Real CDP Program, which is a certification program and our definition of CDP. A CDP has to take data from all sources. It has to keep all the detail of that data. It has to store it persistently. It has to then create unified profiles and it has to provide access to other systems. So that's what we consider to be the set of functionalities that must be provided by a CDP. 
Other things that are very common are real-time access and identity resolution, but they are not absolutely required. We'll talk a little later about why all those things matter, but in the meantime, Prajal, you want to give a little bit of an introduction to Zeotap? Sure, happy to. So Zeotap is a customer intelligence platform, uh, a position we've arrived at over the last uh, six and a half years. By uh, virtue of evolution uh, from the very early days of being a, a data and then an identity company, um, we were fortunate this year to be named one of Gartner's cool vendors. And last year we were at Exchanger's data enabling technology platform of choice. The next slide, please, David. Um, very quickly, a primer, we uh, have an integrated offering that includes a CDP, native identity resolution, and an enterprise data asset across 14 markets. We work with some of the world's top brands and we're a team of 163 now, I believe, the majority of whom are in data and engineering. Back to you, David. Okay, great. So as I say, we're gonna do this in a kind of informal Q&A format because that actually works pretty well. So the first question that we're asking ourselves is how is the CDP Institute, or industry I should say, holding up under COVID and where's the growth coming from? Uh, top of mind for all of us. So we do a lot of research and a lot of data. So I'm gonna run you through uh, some numbers here and then we'll stop and, and let Pajol um, get his perspective on it. So the first answer is, yeah, the CDP industry continues to grow every six months. We do a scan of all the companies in the world that we consider to be CDPs. As of uh, last June, there were about 120 of them. They had about 10,000 employees working on CDP in particular. So as you see here from the graph, nice continued growth, uh, both in number of vendors and employees, which is probably a better measure and funding also coming up. So the industry continues to grow in, in, in the face of COVID. In terms of how many companies use CDPs, which is arguably a more important measure, we have seen again, a substantial growth. We take these surveys over time. This is actually a different survey from the previous one where we asked the CDP Institute members about their deployment. Obviously the CDP Institute members are not exactly a random sample of all marketers, but nevertheless, we do see a, continue, uh, a substantial increase in the number who actually deploy the CDP. Uh, so that's a, a good sign that people are actually not just talking about CDPs, but in fact, deploying them. Um, now, what's happened under COVID in particular, uh, all is not wine and roses. Um, we have seen that many vendors continue to grow, but a fair number of vendors actually, vendors actually did shrink. This uh, graph, each bar is a vendor, and then the things that are going to the left there are companies that decreased their employment in the last six months, according to our data. Others are ones that increased, so as you can see, more increased than decreased, but there are some vendors who uh, took a hit. So CDP is uh, like every other industry, has, has kind of struggled a bit under COVID. So Prajong, I'm going to stop there. Uh, you have any comments on how, how's, how's Zeotap doing in, in, in COVID land? <laughs> well, I, I think we're one of the fortunate ones. If you, if you look at the, uh, the corpus of our client base, I think you can broadly categorize them in, in, in two buckets. Uh, one is a set of folks who've been impacted tangibly by uh, all that's happened, all that's transpired over the last six months. And in most cases there, I think um, the companies that are trying to take a more positive outlook of uh, things are using this as an opportunity to assess their marketing investments and double down in areas where they believe there is opportunity to drive efficiencies um, or for, for that matter, set the stage for next year and the year afterwards when they expect to get back on the growth track. And there, especially um, customer data, customer data platforms, identity, all of these are top of mind. Especially if you take into account all that's been announced this year, very early in the year by Google around third party cookies, and then most recently by Apple, all of that's feeding a certain uh, sort of cohesive uh, focus on everything around data and identity. The other domain of customer, customers are those whose uh, businesses have been resilient or even benefited from all that's happened. And there, 
Um, it, it could be the entire business. It could be aspects of the business. Those that are more digital centric, even as the, the, the physical footprints uh, recede a bit or diminish. And especially in the digital domain, there's a profusion of data that's generated across multiple channels. And that too drives renewed interest in everything around, especially some of the points you spoke to earlier, David, around the unified customer view, being able to connect the dots, uh, being able to pull data from multiple sources into a single repository, and then push them back into multiple last mile systems. So all in all, I think it's been a, it's been a good year for those in our corner of the industry. But um, if I'm honest, it's been, um, th there have been months when we've, we've felt where, where maybe uh, things might be a bit grim and others where uh, things have been better. All in all, if I look back on the last 11 months, they were probably not as rosy as we, as we predicted in January, but uh, certainly far better than many, many had anticipated in March or April uh, when the initial signs of the slowdown first came to be. Yeah, and that's pretty much what we're hearing from other folks as well, that, uh, you know, some companies accelerated their projects, the digital transformation actually benefited immensely. Uh, other companies, of course, pulled in their horns a bit. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, a mixed message, but certainly not all bad news, and certainly plenty of good news. So in terms of the industry in general, looking uh, a little more deeply now, uh, and there were these, this data is as of June, so the latest date or July. So, you know, the full impact of COVID hadn't been felt yet. But what we've seen historically is that the CDP industry started out, if you look at the companies in particular, you know, very heavily U.S. oriented. America's is almost entirely U.S. here. Uh, and that share has shrunk more as other areas have grown. So EMEA and APAC both kind of... But then the last year or so, uh, the U.S. industry kind of stabilized its share, and that shows up in employment uh, as well. So it hasn't been a lot of change in the, in the, the regional distribution recently. On the other hand, if you look at the types of CDPs, and we'll talk about the different CDP types later, the ones that do more of the core data processing stuff, the database building, which are data CDPs, are the ones that build the database and do analytics their share has really shrunk considerably and the growth has really come in those who do not just data and analytics, but also do campaign management or some sort of message selection. And actually some of them who, who do delivery. So the actual sending of the emails or the web pages or whatever it is, whatever kind of delivery they're doing, that's really been where the growth has been in the industry as companies buy CDPs that build a database, but also do something with it. And that has continued and we think that's even continued during the COVID period. That's what this data shows. But even since then, we get a sense there. So again, so companies are looking for very practical near-term solutions uh, in, in this particular environment that we're in. Uh, and the CDPs that are actually delivering marketing execution as, as well as simply building a database are the ones that have benefited. Um, let me just go briefly here into the types of CDPs. I just hinted at that. Again, so there are data CDPs that just do building of the data, building of that unified customer profile, and then sharing it out, because that's what CDPs do. There are some that do the data plus analytics, like predictive modeling or, or uh, journey or, or uh, journey uh, measurement, journey analysis, not journey delivery, but just journey measurement. Um, and those are analytics CDPs, and then we have those that are actually sending out messages or selecting messages, running campaigns or real-time interaction. Some do delivery and then some down at that very bottom do operational things. So they're actually an operational system, like a ticketing system that might also have a CDP. Now, when you get down to things that do delivery and do operations, to call that a CDP is a little misleading. They do a lot of other things and the CDP is just one set of functions within a larger. So we tend to talk about those as CDP inside. Now, I only spend so much time on this because there is so much confusion out there in the marketplace about what's a CDP, what isn't the CDP, what's the definition of CDP. So again, the CDP Institute's position on this is you're a CDP if you do the things that CDPs do. If you build that database, that's a set of functions or features that you have. You may have other functions and features in the same package. You may have analytics capabilities, you may have campaign capabilities, delivery capabilities, and so on. Uh, that's great. That's not what makes you a CDP for a given buyer. That may be the reason they buy you as opposed to another one. But in terms of what's a CDP, a CDP has got set of functions. 
So Joel, you want to comment on that? Because I think you guys, you guys slice things a little differently. We do, but we do share the view that CDPs need to do more than just aggregate or unified data. Um, and I think that's a function of, um, well, there's been a, lot, a flurry of interest around CDPs, but in the same breath, I think CDPs run the risk of going the way of the, of the DMP in that they run the risk of over-promising and under-delivering unless they can drive some kind of actionable execution focused um, um, activity, or they can literally deliver some kind of tangible outcome. And um, I, I think there, especially given the nature of, of the client, we've seen a, you know, a smorgasbord of use cases. It really runs the gamut depending on A, you know, the industry and B, what, what the marketing goals or the, um, or the desired marketing outcomes are, but very much across the board, there's a, there's a sense that it needs to be more than just a static storage or, or you know, some kind of uh, accumulation of data from multiple sources. It needs to be actionable. It needs to drive delivery. It needs to show execution. And to that end, it probably needs to be integrated across multiple aspects of the overall value chain, if you will, in order to be able to connect the dots. Okay, yeah, and that's, um, again, there's no question that that the mark, the, the end use case has to involve activation. Just building a database for the sake of building a database uh, is not terribly productive. So then some CDPs, as I say, include those functionalities, uh, including certainly uh, Zeta. Others are more limited, or Zeotap rather. Uh, others are, more limited, but either way, you have to get to those other functions uh, in, in your system. Otherwise, you're not getting any value. So next question. How are the enterprise software vendors who are also adding CDPs into their stack impacting the market? Again, so that gets right back to that notion of what's the scope of the CDP. And if you're an enterprise software vendor like uh, Oracle or Microsoft, all of those guys at this point have delivered something that meets our definition of a CDP and as you see, they've, they've delivered those uh, kind of over a period of time. Oracle actually had something uh, two years ago, uh, Salesforce really just last month finally got around to delivering something. SAP just the other week to, um, announced their version of a CDP. Um, so Joel, you, you've been around. What have you seen in terms of the impact of what these guys are doing on your business or the market in general? So, you know, it's, it's the very nature of our industry in some ways that there are multiple 800 pound gorillas in the room, I, I suppose. Um, I, I have to be careful about what I say here, but I, I should say this, it, the, the presence of these larger players doesn't necessarily have us quaking in our boots, uh, if I'm very honest. Um, of course, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot that they bring to the table, but by virtue of being these behemoths, they also come with a certain degree of complexity that's um, not always easy for them to overcome themselves. So they, they often end up tripping over themselves. It's a very wide portfolio of products and services. Uh, they're often competing for attention within the organization um, more often than not, it's an accumulation of multiple assets that have been acquired over the last, uh, in some cases, over the last decade. And they are attempting to get them to be interoperable, to, to stitch the dots together, but it's not always suboptimal because most of these are still independent companies in many respects. So all, all of that to say, uh, I, I think these, they're great. I, I wish Zeotap could be here as, as one of these companies someday. But for the time being, we're, we're very confident of what we have in terms of our asset base. Okay, and actually the next question is, is more specifically, how are the vendors impacting that? So, uh, but le let me, there are a couple of things that the presence uh, of, of the uh, big enterprise vendors have done to, to the industry. The first, and I hate to say it, is like legitimize the CDP. It didn't need to be legitimized. Let me write, it was already legitimate. We do not need to say that's <laughs> more so or anybody else to make CDP legitimate. Thank you very much. But there are a lot of people who kind of look at those guys, and those guys, uh, in classic, um, you know, market uh, software vendor fashion, until they had a product, they kind of poo-pooed the whole notion 
And then of course, once they have a product, they decide, well, golly, actually, now that you mentioned it, it is really important. And it is really, uh, you do really need one. And of course you need ours. So they're not out there uh, attacking CDP as some of them were until fairly recently. And that's a good thing. Uh, they also bring a, along a lot of people who are kind of not even paying that close attention, to be honest. Now you have their marketing machines out there talking CDP. And as I say, it took them quite some time, but now they kind of talk CDP in the same language that we do in terms of the functionality uh, of, of assembling those unified persistent profiles, because for a long time they didn't in particular think persistence counted. Um, so in some way there's, they are going to be contributing to a uh, clearer and more uniform and consistent understanding of what a CDP does and doesn't do, uh, or at least what those CDP core CDP functions are. So that, that's all a good thing. Clearly they will suck up some air, you know, four, 800 pound gorillas in the same room doesn't leave much room for anybody else. Uh, so they're all, everyone else is kind of dancing uh, underneath their large gorilla <laughs> feet, uh, which is a frightening image, just don't look up. Um, so, <laughs> Don't look up. Uh, so, so you know, it, 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 there, there will be some business that they get, but they also expand the market. They also are people, you know, they're kind of uh, slow followers, or whatever you want to call them, who we're not really going to jump out and buy until those guys kind of said, yeah, this is a legitimate thing. And now that they have said that, hopefully those people are smart enough to look around and not just buy the, the one that they happen to see. They'll go out, they'll assess. And the thing to bear in mind as a buyer is that these are you know 1.0 releases and frankly they're 1.0 releases that were kind of rushed to market so they're nowhere near as mature as the systems from the more established older cdp vendors like like a zeotap for example so uh you know it, it's it's a net good thing um uh and none of the vendors i've talked to to Joel's comment uh, are quaking in their boots about this you know they certainly have uh to recognize that, that it's out there, it probably changes their sales pitch a bit. They can spend a little less time on it, general education because some of that lift is now carried by the other guys, by the big vendors, but they also still have to educate marketers about how these things differ and why they're not all the same. And what do you want to look for to actually make sure you get a system that uh, you know meets your true needs. Um, Joe, anything else on this topic before we move ahead? Maybe just to draw an analogy, a, a sledgehammer has its place, a scalpel has its own place, and the two are not, uh, you know, uh, substitutes for each other. So I think horses for courses, there will be um, cases where it would make sense for a client to go with a, a larger marketing cloud deployment, uh, potentially a, a multi-year strategy. Uh, there are other cases where, uh, you know, solutions like Zeotap. Um, or others on this uh, slide where a client is looking for, you know, quick delivery, fast time to value, potentially driving efficiencies, potentially getting more bespoke attention. Um, all of those would uh, trump other benefits that some of the larger marketing clouds could bring to the table. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think uh, it very much legitimizing the space, growing the space, um, bringing attention in many cases to some of the smaller companies by virtue of shining a spotlight on all that customer data is and can be. Um, so a net positive, I would say. Yep. Oh, no, de definitely, definitely. It's a net positive. All right. And so now the next question, it was, well, which industries have adopted CDP and which have adopted them kind of first? And actually, it's been very interesting, at least in our observation, that Starting with the first adoption, the CDP category, I named the CDP category in 2013. I don't know what happened in 23, but in 2013, that actually named the category. Uh, and the first deployments were, were high, heavily concentrated in retail and the media. Uh, both industries where you have a lot of low, high frequency, low value transactions, primarily online here, where it's very easy to see that better personalization, better targeting gives you immediate results. Media here, meaning things like uh, a Netflix or a Spotify that was trying to pick the right content for people that was a, or a publisher trying to pick the right article to show to someone that that was the core application there. Then the next wave came around 2017 roughly where all of a sudden financial services, travel, telco, B2B kind of started to adopt CDP. Uh, those are industries with a little longer sales cycle, a little you know, higher ticket but fewer purchases. 
um, more complicated customer journey. So you could see it would take a little while for them to adapt CDP. They were also by and large actually more sophisticated in their infrastructure. So they had a little uh, less of a gap to fill with the CDP. Right now we're beginning in 2019 and 2020 to see yet more industries come on board, education, uh, particularly in the US like higher ed. So uh, either online education or recruiting the people to go to college if people still go to college or attend college at home nowadays. Uh, or healthcare organizations, health insurance in the U.S. and and the uh, packaged goods, uh, actually of all people coming in just more recently, again even more complicated purchase, even larger ticket, even fewer uh, buys, well, not the packaged goods but the other two. So a kind of a clear progression that basically the the notion of CDP kind of expanding and people in those other industries, those adjacent industries, seeing oh yeah these guys over in retail are using it, maybe it applies to me in financial use guys in financial use, it maybe applies to me in education. So that kind of a growth uh, throughout, which again is a standard kind of typical thing to happen, uh, you know, in, in, as any, any technology gets adopted and sort of diffuses throughout more and more industries. Uh, Pajol, what's, what's been your, uh, your trajectory? It's been uh, similar. And if you, if you look from left to right, I think one of the drivers of adoption has been well, the wealth of customer data at uh, someone's disposal to begin with. And retail and media by design are industries where folks are sitting or clients, brands are sitting on uh, you know, a wealth of customer data uh, that's generated on a, on a you know, hourly, weekly, monthly uh, basis. Uh, in the case of finance and telecoms, I think it's not been the, 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 the quantum of data that's been a challenge as much as some of the potential constraints uh, related to privacy and compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a company that works very um, closely with a number of uh, large banks, financial services providers and telecom operators, the, the primary concern before any other conversation tends to be uh, uh, you know, an almost protracted discussion around consent, around privacy. And, and rightly so, they are sitting on a wealth of you know, sensitive data in many cases that needs to be handled uh, with uh, with a certain degree of care, and um, uh, and there aren't a lot of platforms out there that, that are able to meet their rigorous standards. I think in the case of FMCG, it's been an interesting uh, process of evolution, uh, especially if you look at the rise of DTC direct to consumer brands in the last uh, five years or so. The those that that are building a dig digital first customer direct uh, offering. Uh, where uh, the digital channels allow them to build these direct customer relations. I say that sitting on the board of a company that does exactly that. And it, in some ways it allows them to circumvent many of the more traditional distribution models, uh, which of course has other efficiencies, but most importantly, builds intimate end customer relationships, uh, get information directly from the customer with their consent and use that as a platform for everything from you know, marketing oriented use cases through to product development even. And that's where I think, especially if I, if I look at our client base uh, in the recent past, a lot of the FMCG, the, the larger FMCG players have taken an, um, quite an interest in the DTC space, looking either to acquire DTC companies or partner with DTC companies or even adopt certain DTC models or ideas for the purposes of building out that, that pool of customer data. Uh, what that means for us is from left to right with uh, retail, it's more about making sense of their data. Whereas with FMCG, because their own data is sparse in many respects to begin with, it's often a function of being able to extend their internal assets using some of the identity and profile data we bring to the table. So it tends to be a bit of a mixed bag in terms of what exactly they're looking for in a CDP. Yep. yep. Okay. And in case my grandmother is listening, FMCG is fast moving consumer goods, <laughs> uh, D to C direct to consumer. But most, I'm going to guess most of you already do that. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it has been a very interesting and we're not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I have a couple of theories about why the progression happened this way. And of course it could just be totally random, but there are some of the things that you were just mentioning that certainly played in. Um, moving right along. Uh, so what's happening on the technology front? So there are a lot of technologies. It's funny because uh, you know, again, uh, category not that old, but there has been enough time to see some interesting developments. So actually some sort of 
frontiers that we see, relatively new developments on, we see more use of CDP on the cloud platforms, AWS and Azure, Google Cloud, um, that add more and more capability to manage the data and manage the data in ways that are appropriate to CDP. Um, we see cloud databases like Snowflake in particular, highly suitable for various technical reasons to what you do in the CDP. We're seeing more and more use, of course, of artificial intelligence and machine learning from the data side. So just discovery of the data, what data does my company have? We actually are AI systems now can go out and just sort of uh, you know, scan around your company and look at all the data sources. Oh, here's some customer data, here's some customer data, here's some customer data, because that actual mapping of the data of the existing sources and pulling it in is a big bottleneck in getting your CDP up. And so there's considerable help now in some cases from AI for that and the cleaning and the matching as well. And then of course, on the other side, using AI and ML to actually select offers and optimize journeys. So sort of make the decisions that marketers would otherwise have to make by hand, which, you know, that cuts into lunch time. So you don't want to do that if you can avoid it. Um, and then we also see another trend, both in B2B and B2C, of third party data coming in more and more. B2, uh, CDP traditionally been about first party data, still primarily first party and known. And, and those are not the same thing. You could have anonymous first party and you can have known third party. Um, but now more and more people bringing in third party data to, to enrich those first party profiles of your customers and sometimes bring in prospects. So that's a little less normal. So, so again, for Joel, what, what technologies are you particularly excited about uh, as you look ahead for Zeotap? Um, I, I think there is in some respects a consolidation of the platform layer and the infrastructure layer almost where uh, clients come to us and um, are rightly asking for solutions that often integrate the two. So if I think of um, one of our products that speaks to a lot of what you have on this slide, it's the data clean room. And now I know David that uh, given the, the, the core definition of a CDP, a data clean room is not one of the requisite modules, but it is something clients are asking for, asking for quite a bit. Um, and in their mind, it's a solution that integrates both the platform and the infrastructure layer. So, uh, you know, some kind of secluded isolated environment where they can combine first party data with second party and third party data, uh, build these holistic enriched user profiles, uh, do basic analytics, or everything from basic analytics to you know, heavy lifting on the data science front, be able to plug that into the visualization engines they use, Tableau, Power BI, uh, and so on and so forth. And then feed some of the learnings back through to the channels that they use for activation. And that's a classic example of a lot of these different aspects coming together in a single solution that integrates application platform and uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a consolidated offering. And I, I think we'll see more of those increasingly as marketers become more sophisticated and ask for these packaged solutions rather than having to deal with individual layers or individual point solutions that uh, allow them to serve certain use cases, but only by stitching multiple different things together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we could easily spend 20 minutes on data clean rooms, which is a <laughs> fascinating topic. Um, yeah. uh, but just the quick definition of the DCR, another acronym for, for, for you there, Grandma, if you're keeping notes at home, um, would, would be that the data comes into a facility that, that, that is sort of isolated from the rest of the world. So you, so you can put your data and then you can give other people access to uh, anonymized or pseudonymized or somehow disguised versions of the data so privacy is not violated. Uh, but they can do their analysis, they can learn a lot of things and they can pull out just limited amounts. Sometimes you can pull out a list, more often just a report or some analytical result without seeing the individual data. So it's Use in a variety of ways where people don't, don't want to quite share all their data and particularly not share the private data, but still want to give other people access to it. That's a very vague but general notion of what, what, what data clean rooms are about. And it is kind of a hot topic, probably should be on here someplace. Um, okay, <laughs> moving right along and speaking of privacy, uh, which is certainly one of our, my favorite topics, um, what's going on on the privacy front with CDPs? He asked himself, and then he answered himself. So, well, CDPs. Uh, have a lot of relationship with privacy. It's interesting. There are privacy management systems that are not CDP systems. There are one or two CDPs that actually combine them. By and large, they're separate. But 
a lot of the things that you do to deploy a CDP are things you have to do to meet privacy requirements. So you have to find out where all your personal data is. Well, guess what? If you're going to build a CDP, you have to figure that as well. You have to capture and record consent. You have to respond to data subject access requests when somebody asks to see their data or to release their data. You have to manage a policy that says this kind of data can be used for this sort of thing. And it's not quite that simple because it has to do with the country that they're in, the permissions that they've given and the purpose and all kinds of stuff. And they have to document what, I, what I've done with the data because that could also be something regulators ask. So, so those are all things that a CDP does that are relevant to privacy. There are solutions that somehow you need to have in place to meet privacy regs and the CDP kind of helps. So it's a supporting technology. Um, and then the other things that CDPs can be used for or are needed for, well, we're replacing third party cookies. You've all heard that to death. Um, you know, well, that makes first party data more important. Again, first party data is what all about the CDP. Using alternative IDs like hashed emails, you got to store that someplace, building lookalike models, hosting the second party data sharing or the data clean rooms. Um, doing better analytics. Those are all things that CDPs make possible. So there are two ways that the CDP kind of interacts with privacy. Uh, and I just talked a lot, but Joe, you want to comment on that? Um, increasingly, as companies look to take advantage of their first party assets and the regulatory landscape evolves, um, everything around consent and compliance is, is top of mind. Um, one could argue it's been so in Europe ever since GDPR was first announced two and a half years ago, though it's taken a while for it to really sink in, if, if I'm honest, in, in, in many cases for many companies. Uh, in the US with um, CCPA, I think that was, that was the first indication that the, the regulatory landscape was looking to mimic Europe in some respects with the, the recently announced CPRA, the Privacy Rights Act. It's another step in that direction. So there is a there is a certain harm, upcoming harmonization of the of regulation the world over around how customer data can and should be handled, and we think it's a it's a good thing. It's it, it, it's important that customer data is treated with the respect it deserves. Um, to that, all of that to basically say that everything around consent, being able to collect consent, manage consent, reflect granular consent for specific use cases is increasingly something we see clients ask for as uh, an integral component of uh, any kind of data platform they are looking to adopt. Um, and that's, that's something that's been, um, I think, consistent across every single conversation we've had, whether that's in North America or in Europe or even uh, further East in India. Um, the other thing, of course, that's top of mind for marketers is, is the, the future of identity in the context of marketing. Um, going back to uh, our earlier discussion around uh, third party cookies and Google's announcement from January and then Apple's most recent announcement, everyone's looking to the future of identification in marketing uh, as it pertains to, in, in, in the very base case, just paid media, so just advertising. Um, but then looking further um, to more complicated use cases around um, measurement, around analytics, around uh, more holistic customer lifecycle management, all of it becomes more complicated if these platform provided IDs that currently hold the ecosystem together just go away. Um, Zeotap has a, has a native solution there in the form of ID plus, which is on the back of uh, the authenticated web. Uh, we're working with some of the other leaders in the space to ensure that there is full interoperability, uh, primarily because we see uh, eventually the, the, the manifestation of marketing identity in the form of between three and five universal ID players, all of whom are, who are built or predicated on the same idea of authentication, um, specifically e email addresses or phone numbers, but of course, those need to be uh, tokenized so that uh, sensitive data is not leaked. Um, but it doesn't help marketers if, if the ability to uh, measure or to, to track customer journeys remains siloed across three different or five or even more different identity solutions. And therefore, we uh, and others in the space are looking at full interoperability to ensure that these solutions, even if it ends up being between three and five, which is likely going to be the case, some global, some more local, the, the, the different solutions can talk to each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, it's, um, it, it's extremely interesting. So apparently we have a question from the audience, which means they're awake, sure. about, about privacy. <laughs> I, yes, this is Tina. Thank you for that. I, um, I will read it as it's been presented to me. Um, compliance and in info security was mentioned and the sensitivity to it. How and where do you see the current EU crackdown and the coming US crackdown on consumer data privacy going to impact the non quote unquote behemoth companies like Zeotap? <laughs> I think, uh, so, so let me, so as, as Zeotap is a company that was uh, born in Germany, so in the very heart of GDPR land, uh, it, it's, it's, in some respects, uh, which means that um, it, it's been top of mind for us from the very beginning. And um, most companies I know of that are looking to ensure GDPR compliance are doing it not just for the purposes of the offering in Europe, but globally, because as we discussed, regulation is converging and becoming likely going to be um, similar across the board. Um, I think uh, companies like Zeotap uh, are hold an advantage because we are more agile to begin with, which allows us to navigate any changes in regulation. So even over the last, so Zeotap was founded in 2014. Uh, uh, we had a GDPR, then we had CCPA. We've had a regulation in Asian markets in India. We've had regulation in Brazil. We've been nav navigated all of those quite successfully by virtue of being still a small, relatively small, uh, lean company. Uh, I also think that it's important uh, what philosophy one uh, aligns oneself with. And at Zeotap, we firmly believe that uh, privacy and compliance should be top of mind for marketers in order to ensure that the trust they have, they've built or they're looking to build with their customer base is not compromised in any way. And therefore, compliance is treated as a first-class citizen across our stack. Uh, that's true, not just of Zeotap, but of some other companies in the space that we, that we know of as well. And that's important for the purposes of anything uh, that's uh, any kind of use case around customer data. Yep. Okay, that's great. So we're gonna uh, move along. We'll have to pick up the pace a bit because there's just so many fascinating things, seriously, uh, to talk about. Um, let's talk a little about CDP use cases. That's a favorite question of everyone in the world. Um, what we've seen in our research is that, um, that there's a sequence to use cases. I mean, CDP use case, let me just be really clear, is a use case that takes advantage of the CDP, which usually comes down, long story short, to something that requires sharing data across systems, either two systems providing data and merging that data, which otherwise would be separate, or mo data moving from one system to another system, like from the web site to the CRM system, for example. Those are the classic CRM, uh, CDP use cases. Uh, but then there's a, a kind of a hierarchy where people tend to start with the customer view, just assembling the data, and there's things you can do with that, and then doing analysis on that data, and then it sort of builds onto running campaigns and eventually doing orchestration. So this is one of the surveys. We do a lot of surveys. And that sequencing kind of follows actually the, the frequency of the answers here. So, so basically the takeaway that for you is if you have data in multiple places that you can't use together, you can't combine either for analysis or because you want to share it across systems, that's a core CDP use case. Um, for Joel, you want to comment on like what are people most commonly using Zeotap for? So um, I, I think uh, what we see is uh, reflected in, 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 in this chart here, everything around customer data unification to build that single customer view is top of mind for marketers. Uh, and, and that that is the, it, it's basic hygiene in some respects. That's the foundation on which any further activity can take place. Um, in Zeotap's case specifically, because we have a native identity resolution asset, it allows us to connect IDs that the, that the client themselves might not know are the same person. So, you know, you could have a transaction in store, you could have someone land on your website, unless you have the ability to connect those two IDs, you don't know that it's the same person, you can't build that unified customer view. So I think that stands us in good stead in most conversations, being able to work with, um, for being able to provide this uh, natively integrated ID resolution asset. Of course, it is possible to do it with uh, point solutions, but that makes it so much harder and there's a drop um, uh, match rates go down and, and, and all of that. So it, it's, it's far better to do it with an integrated offering. 
but uh, everything downstream is rapidly becoming top of mind as well. So if you go back to what, what you showed earlier, David, around campaigns, um, I think the unified customer view then feeds those campaigns, which see, feeds uh, measurement, which feeds that customer lifecycle management and so on and so forth. So the moment the customers uh, or our clients, the moment they have this platform or foundation to build on, they're rapidly looking to um, extend the, uh, the value that unified customer view can bring to the marketing organization or, or for that matter, the product development organization or other organizations within the company. Yeah, and funny you should mention that because uh, because that's exactly what we've, we've, we've uh, looked at the published case histories, published use cases in our library. And what we find is that if we look at just what's published, most of the use cases tend to be at this earlier stage. You can look at this as data maturity stage as sort of a maturity model. So just unifying and then analyzing being the fancier things as you go to the right here. And so the, the published use cases tend to be concentrated towards the less uh, sophisticated end. First things first is all we're saying here. But if you go and you run a workshop and you ask the marketers what they want from the CDP, all their answers tend to cluster around the actual applications, the campaigns and the interactions and the omnichannel stuff. So what people really wanna do with the CDP is the thing that gives them value, the things that are actual activities, activations of some sort or another. So that's exactly uh, what, what Joel is, is saying here. So that's totally uh, consistent with what we see in the real world. David, this is Tina. I am going to interject with a question, if I may, because we get this quite often, um, and, and it seems relatively simple, yet not, which is just an organizational question. Who in the company is the main CDP buyer? I mean, you've talked about, obviously, the marketers. Is it the marketers themselves? Are you working directly with the data analysts? Um, it seems to be a moving target. It is, and of course, it varies company to company. Um, and we, we see kind of two, two, two different buying centers. Usually it's going to be marketing, okay, still today, driving the business users. But sometimes it's going to be the data, you know, chief data officer, chief analytics officer, even the IT people who are building not a marketing system, but an enterprise system. And the enterprise guys, you know, they're, they have a broader view and, and they're more focused on those data management uh, capabilities of the CDP and less on the marketing capabilities. Uh, Pajol, you're, I think, gonna, gonna tell me that, you know, most of your clients are more on the marketing side, but answer that question. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. So marketing first uh, and, and primary uh, data, a close second, in some cases, of course, uh, uh, the, the primary uh, stakeholder, depending on the organizational structure. But what we do notice is that regardless of where uh, we drop anchor, if you will, within the organization, the touch points are manifold. So there, there is always IT involvement. There is uh, privacy and compliance involvement that those are typically separate teams. Um, there is um, often finance involvement because one of the reasons for uh, bringing uh, uh, any, any kind of CDP oriented use case is to drive some degree of efficiency around spend uh, typically marketing spend, but often uh, infrastructure or technology infrastructure spend as well. So it tends to be a multi-pronged conversation uh, very quickly, but the, the initial touch point is typically marketing or data or some combination thereof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. sure. So, uh, and actually, um, we talked to uh, uh, our uh, sequence here. There, there's actually a set of slides that deals with that very question. But quickly here, so in terms of best practices for deployment, um, and I'm just going to really say very, very quickly, when people select the MarTech, the most important thing is to actually look at your, your features that you need and get the things that your use cases tell you that you need, not just the one that's the cheapest or the prettiest. And that's what this slide says in many more words than that. And the second thing, again, just in terms of best practices, is that our research shows that the people who are more satisfied with the results are the people who tend to have more formal marketing management or technology management practices in place, whether it's a center of excellence or a guide, long-term plan to guide their tech selection or agile. Like, it almost doesn't even matter. Just having something intelligent in place as opposed to just sort of randomly selecting systems because somebody you know, gets excited because they saw an ad somewhere or a webinar. Um, that, that you really, if the more organized you are, the happier you can 
the better results you're going to have. So uh, again, we're running out of time. So, but but um, Joel, you want to comment on any of that? What have you seen as best practices for for success? We have seen um, brands work extensively with third parties that serve as um, consigliaries, if you will, uh, in the CDP procurement process, uh, small or large companies that are considered uh, subject matter experts that uh, brands often lean on for this decision-making, um, which is, uh, can, 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 can certainly add value um, because they are very familiar with the landscape and they can best articulate the brand's needs to the vendors and um, translate the vendor uh, feature set to specific brand use cases, but they need to be integrated deep enough within the organization that they fully understand the short-term and long-term uh, targets and outcomes and don't make recommendations that uh, end up being sort of uh, adjunct or ancillary and that sort of fly past, but don't really add value to the organization. Yeah, and that's, uh, I don't do that anymore. That's how I made my living for most of my life. <laughs> uh, so I'm totally in, in agreement with the fact that people like that are needed. Uh, and to, to modestly plug the CDP Institute, uh, we have a directory of some of the vendor, some of the service providers who do that. We also actually have an RFP generator and a use case generator that's right on the website to help you guys out if you want to do it yourself. But it's not a skill that marketers learn in marketing school, you know, technology selection. So they, they often do need uh, and benefit greatly from outside assistance of people who understand both marketing and technology. Um, very quickly, because we're running out of time, the question here about what were the obstacles to overcome? And this is again, data utilization, not specifically CDP. Uh, and the two big ones that jump out really are the assembly of the data, which is what the CDP is supposed to solve. And then simply the lack of time or lack of skill to marketing staff and usually if you ask the marketing staff, it's that they lack time. If you ask anybody else, the other marketers lack skill. So you can interpret that, that answer either way. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but, you know, marketers only have a certain amount of time. Any, you know, we're all busy people, right? Um, so how much time can they invest in anything? They have to choose their time wisely and prioritize. And the CDP is, uh, uh, you know, one of many com competing investments to make. So any, any other comments on, you know, what you've seen as uh, obstacles to success, Joe, either with data in general yeah, for, or CDP in particular? Absolutely. Uh, um, from, from our perspective, I think one of the challenges we've seen is when, uh, when the procurement post process selects a, a, a CDP technology that's deployed by a third party, by an SI, a system integrator, um, and that, that's very often the case, especially the larger the platform, the more often the more is the case that is deployed by a, a third party. Uh, and that often results in uh, just much longer deployment periods, much longer time to value. Uh, there's occasionally a lack of accountability because there's sort of finger pointing back and forth in case you know some of these challenges occur. So we believe it's better if the um, if the vendor or the the CDP platform uh, deploys themselves rather than relying too too heavily on third parties. Of course, third parties can add some value, but the the, the ownership of or the accountability of deployment should reside with the platform or the vendor. And the other thing we've noticed is that um, it's very hard to plan in three to five year circles in, uh, in, because the landscape is shifting so fast that um, the vendors need to ensure that their product innovation stays at top of all that's changing in the marketing landscape. And especially on the MarTech side of things, everything around identity, everything around data and regulation changes so quickly. It's important to pick platforms that are innovating rapidly enough to keep up with the changing times. Yep, and, and so just in case anyone's confused, and I agree with exactly what Prajal said, which is use outside consultants to help pick the system, but then the deployment itself, it's much better to actually work directly with the vendor. I totally agree with that 100%. Um, okay, and we're, we're, we're in good time here. So last question, what's the future? Ooh, that's scary. Um, what's the future look like? Now, part of the value of CDP, to be Joel, what Joel just said, is that the CDP kind of, to some extent, future-proofs your organization, because it puts the data in one safe place. So if you want to swap out your email system or your web system, or there's some magical new channel that shows up yesterday, you know, um, we're just hearing about uh, sound audio uh, marketing. God only knows what that's going to be like, or smell marketing. People are actually talking about that. Uh, you know, the data is all going to be in the CDP. A bit easier to do that 
So CDP to some extent is about future proof. But, but Joel, what are you what are you seeing? Where are you seeing the industry going? Oops. Um, honestly, I see more consolidation, David. Uh, that's sort of the nature of the industry. Uh, if, if you look at the history of Martech over the last twenty years, uh, every new layer of the of the stack, in some respects, has started with this explosion of logos that's rapidly um, been trimmed over the years as uh, companies get acquired or different um, there are mergers, there are acquisitions. Some uh, grow into large companies themselves; others fade. Um, and I don't see the CDP landscape being any different. There was a you know large uh, acquisition just a couple of weeks ago. We will probably see more of those. There will be companies that grow uh, very quickly. We hope Zeotap is one of those. But uh, in one word, uh, a lot of consolidation and integration across the stack. Okay. Yeah, we see that. Um, you know, we're very much following the Gartner hype cycle, just like every other industry, and we're kind of past that first peak, and now we're coming down to the trough of disillusionment when people say, hey, wow, it's not gonna you know, solve all my problems. Uh, but there are specific use cases and we see the industry uh, marketers and users understanding more, more concretely what it can and can't do. Uh, we see a lot more specialization. I think that's the big trend that is gonna come in more, more industry specific CDPs uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, as you, a specialist in an industry, it's easier to do a good job in that industry and that's all also a more defensible position against the sales forces and Adobe's of the world, the big generic guys, who are gonna kind of occupy that middle to, to, to a greater extent. Um, so definitely a lot of um, good growth ahead. Remember, it's still relatively unpenetrated, maybe 10, 15, 20%. At most companies actually have a CDP that we, we would consider a CDP. So there's plenty of room for growth, plenty of change gonna happen, certainly some consolidation as well. Um, and I think we're just about the end of the time, Tina. How much? Yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm going to be curious to see how the um, industry specific CDPs roll out probably early next year. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of information and intel on that already, but I think that's a really good point. So um, thank you both. We are out of time. And I wanted to thank you both Projal and David for joining us today and giving us a lot of intel um, and um, wanted to just uh, thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, once again, just take a few minutes to complete our post webinar survey that you will get um, shortly um, this afternoon. And we love your feedback so we can continue to deliver programs that are value to your, uh, to your function. Everyone have a great afternoon and thanks again. Hey, thanks. Bye. Thank you very much.